If you're feeling frisky, I mean, I've got blindfolds for you. Awesome. Have any of you seen a reading before? Have you seen one? I have not. But apparently I, I guess you won't see it anyways, but been to one. Experienced one. I love reading. The Josh Bell. Have you had the Josh Bell experience? Would you like a blindfold? No. Thank you. I'll the book Okay. Sure. No, would you like it? That might be fine. What's it for? Um, it's it's just for fun, really. It, it you know you take out one of your senses and you can experience more, and it plays a big role in the book. In the book, the characters have to be blindfolded because they are in a world where they see something and something bad happens. No, 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 no. No, it's just a part of the reading. It's just something. One of the characters has an idea of what's going on, and I I might agree with him. I'm not sure, but I think I agree with him. And his idea is this, that they all know that there's some sort of entities um, that have like sort of been sprouting out, sprouting about town, that have come, that have arrived. There's something outside, right? And um, if you can imagine for a second the idea of, you know, infinity, and when people say you can't comprehend where time begins or space ends, <clears throat> and if you were to try to fathom that, or really wrap your head around it, you would go mad, you know, because our, our brains, our minds aren't capable of comprehending infinity, right? So if you can imagine that concept as an actual being in the room with us, right? So infinity personified, something unfathomable out on the front porch, right? So Bird Box is essentially about um, characters who are trying to figure out how to, like, you know, leave the house with this out there. Um, they know that they can't look at it, because that's, that's uh, you know, the equivalent of trying to understand it or, or fathom it, countering it. And so for the majority of the book, they wear blindfolds. When, at least when they're outside. They always do when they're outside. Um, and so, yeah, so this is a scene. That's enough, I think, for you to understand the scene that we're going to do, which is chapter 33. In her first year alone with the children, Tom's voice came to her all the time. So many of his ideas were only spoken, never achieved, but Mallory, with nothing but time on her hands, tried out many of them. We ought to mic the yard, Tom once said. Tom's idea of updating the alarm system from birds to amplifiers. Mallory, alone with two newborns, wanted those microphones. But how? How would she get her hands on microphones, amplifiers, and cords? We could just drive somewhere, Tom said. It's, it's insane. That's impossible, Don answered. No, 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 it's not. Just drive slow. The streets are empty, man. What's the worst that can happen? What are you going to run into? Mallory, rowing, remembers a definitive moment at the bathroom mirror. She'd seen other faces in the glass. Olympia... Tom, Shannon, all of them were pleading, telling her to leave the house to do something more for the further safety of these kids. She was going to have to take a risk on her own. Tom and Jules weren't here to do it for her. Tom's voice back then, always Tom's voice, in her head, in the room, in the mirror. Make a bumper around Cheryl's wagon here. Paint the windshield black. Don't worry about what you run into. Just go. Drive five, six miles an hour. You have babies in the house now, Mallory. You have to know if something is out there. If something is near, the microphones will let you know that. Leaving the bathroom, Mallory went to the kitchen. There she studied the map Felix, Jules, and Tom once used to plan a route to Tom's house on foot. Their notes were still on it, Felix's calculations, and using the scale, she made her own. She wanted Tom's advanced alarm system. She needed it. 
Yet despite her newfound determination, she still didn't know where to go. And late one evening, while the baby slept, she sat at the kitchen table and tried to remember her very first drive to the house. It had been less than a year ago. Back then, her mind was on the address from the ad. But what did she pass along the way? She tried to remember. A laundry mat. That's good. What else? Storefronts were empty. It looked like a ghost town, and you were worried the people who placed the ad might no longer be there. You thought they'd either gone mad or packed up the car and driven far away. Yes, all right. What else? Uh, a bakery. Good. What else? What else? Yes. A bar. Good. What did the marquee want? I don't know. That's a ridiculous question. You don't remember the sadness you felt at the name of The name of Of what? The name of the band. The band? You read the name of the band slated to perform on a date already two weeks in the past. What was it? I'll never remember the name of the band. Right, but the feeling. I don't remember. Yes, you do the feeling. I was sad. I was scared. What did they do there? What? At the bar, what did they do there? I don't know. They drank? They ate? Yes, what else? They, they danced? They danced. Yes. And, and what? How did they dance? I don't know. What did they dance to? They danced to music. They danced to the band. Right. They danced to the band. The band needed microphones. The band needed amplifiers. Tom's ideas lingered in the house like ghosts. Just like we did it. Just like the time Jules and I took a walk, walk around the block. You weren't able to partake in a lot of those activities, Mallory, but you can now. Jules and I rounded up dogs and later used them to walk to my house. Think about it. It all kind of happened in a row. Each step allowed the next to happen, all because we weren't stagnant. We took risks. You've got to do the same thing. Paint the windshield black. Don had laughed when Tom suggested driving blind, but it's exactly what she did. <clears throat> now, Victor, he would help her. Jules once refused to let his dog be used like that, but Mallory had two newborns in a room down the hall. The rules were a little different now. Her body still ached from the delivery. The muscles in her back were always tight. If she moved too quickly, it felt like her groin might snap. Victor, he will protect you. She painted the windshield black with paint from the cellar. She taped socks and sweaters to the inside of the glass. Using wood glue found in the garage and duct tape from the cellar, she fastened blankets and mattresses to the bumpers, all this in the street, all this blindfolded, all this while enduring the pain of being a new mother, punished, it seemed, with every movement of her body. She would have to leave them. She would go on her own. Mallory would drive a quarter of a mile in the opposite direction from which she arrived. She'd turn left, go four miles, then a right, and another two and a half. She'd have to search for the bar from there. She'd bring food for Victor. He would guide her back to the car, back to the food, when she needed him to. Five or six miles an hour sounded reasonable, safe enough. But the first time she tried it, she discovered how awful it would be. Despite the precautions, driving without seeing was horrifying. The wagoneer bounced violently. She ran things over. She'd never be able to identify. Twenty times she struck the curb. Twice she hit poles, once a parked car. And with every click of the odometer, she expected a collision, an injury, or worse. And by the time she returned home, her nerves were shattered. She was empty-handed, unconvinced she had the medal to try it again. But she did. She found the laundromat on the seventh try, and because she remembered it from her first drive to the house, it gave her the courage to try again. Blindfolded and scared, she entered a boot store, a coffee shop, an ice cream parlor, and a theater. She'd heard her shoes echoing off the marble floor of an office lobby. Still, she failed to find the bar. And then, on the ninth afternoon, Mallory entered an unlocked wooden door and immediately knew she had arrived. The smell of sour fruit, stale smoke, and beer was as welcome as any she'd ever known. We found it. Her body was sore, her mind ached, her tongue was dry, she imagined her belly as a deflated dead balloon, but she was here. She searched a long time for the wood of the bar, banging into chairs, she knocked her elbow hard on a post. She tripped once, but a table saved her from falling to the floor. 
She spent a long time trying to understand equipment with her fingers. Was this the kitchen? Was this used to mix drinks? Victor tugged at her playfully, and she turned, banging her stomach against something hard. Uh, it was the bar. Uh, Tying Victor's leash to, leash to what she believed was a steel stool, Mallory stepped behind the bar and felt for the bottles. Every movement was a reminder of how recently she'd given birth. One by one, she brought the bottles to her nose. Whiskey, something peach, something lemon, vodka, gin, and finally, rum. Just like the housemates once tried to enjoy the night Olympia arrived. <clears throat> it felt good in her hands. She carried it with her around the length of the bar. Finding the stool, she sat down, brought the bottle to her mouth, and drank. In her own private darkness, she understood a creature could be sitting at the bar beside her. Possibly the place was full of them. Three at her table, watching her silently, observing the broken, blindfolded woman and her seeing-eyed eye. But right then, for that second, she just didn't care. Victor, you want some? You need some? Mm, man, it felt good. She drank again, remembering how wonderful an afternoon at a bar could be. Forget the babies, forget the house, forget everything. Victor, it's good stuff. But the dog, she recognized, was preoccupied. He was tugging at the leash tied to the stool. Mallory drank again. Victor whined. Victor, what is it? Victor was pulling harder on the leash. He was whining, not growling. Mallory listened to him. The dog sounded too anxious. She got up, untied him, and let him lead the way. Where are we going, Victor? Well, she knew he was taking her back to where they came in, by the door they had entered. They banged into tables along the way. Victor's feet stood on tiles. And Mallory dashed her shin on a chair. The smell was stronger here, the bar smell. And more. Victor! He'd stop and started scratching at something on the floor. It's a mouse. There must be so many in here. She swept her shoe in an arc before it came up against something small and hard. Pulling Victor aside, she fell cautiously on the ground. She thought of the babies and how they would die without her. What is it, Victor? Well, it was a ring of some kind. It felt like steel. There was a small rope. Examining it blindfolded, Mallory understood what it was. She rose. It's a cellar door, Victor. The dog is breathing hard. Let's leave it alone. We need to get some things here. But Victor pulled again. There could be people down there. Hiding, pain, living down there. People who could help you raise the babies. Hello? Hello? <sighs> Sweat dripped from under the blindfold, Victor's nails dug at the wood, and Mallory's body felt like it really might snap as she knelt and pulled the thing open. The smell that came up choked her, and Mallory felt the rum come back up as she vomited where she stood. Victor! Something's rotting down there! Something! Then she felt a true scorching sensation of fear, not the kind that comes to a woman as she drives with a blackened windshield, but the sort of fear that hits her when she's wearing a blindfold and suddenly knows there is someone else in the room. Mallory reached for the door, the door scared she might tumble into the cellar and meet with whatever was at the bottom. The stench was not old food. It was not bad boots. Victor! The dog was yanking, hungry for the source of that smell. Victor, come on! But he continued. This is what a grave smells like. This is death! Uh, quickly, Mallory pulled Victor out of the room and back into the bar, then searched for a post. She found one, made of wood. She tied his leash to it, knelt, and held his face in her hands, begging him to calm down. We need to get back to the babies. You've got to calm down. Uh, Mallory needed to calm down herself. We never determined how animals are affected. We never found out. She turned back blindly toward the hall that led to the cellar. Victor, what did you see down there? Uh, the dog was still. He was breathing too hard. Victor? <coughs> Mallory rose and stepped away from him. Victor, I'm, I'm just stepping over here. I'm going to look for some microphones. 
Oh yeah, part of her started dying. It felt like she was the one going mad. She thought of Jules. Jules, who loved this dog more than he loved himself. This dog was her very last link to the housemates. A torturous growl escaped him. There's a sound she never heard from him, not from any dog on earth. Victor, I'm sorry. Here, I'm so sorry. The dog moved violently. Now he thought he'd broken free. The wood post splintered. Victor barked. <laughs> Backing up, Mallory felt something against her knees. It was a, a riser of some kind. Richard, no, please, I'm so sorry. The dog swung his body, knocking into a table. Oh, God, Victor, stop growling. Stop, please. And Victor couldn't stop. Mallory felt along the carpeted riser behind her. She crawled onto it, afraid to turn her back on what Victor had seen. Huddled and shaking, she listened to the dog go mad. The sound of him pissing. The sound of his teeth snapping as he kicked the empty air. She instinctively reached for a tool, a weapon, and found her hands gripping the steel of some kind of small post. Slowly, Mallory rose, feeling along the length of that steel. And at the top of it, Mallory's fingers encircled a short, oblong object. At its end, she felt something like steel netting. She was on a stage. And she was holding what she had come for. She was holding a microphone. She heard Victor's bone pop, his fur and flesh had torn. Victor! Mallory pocketed the microphone and dropped to her knees. Kill him. Ah, uh, she couldn't kill him. Instead, she searched the stage. Behind her, it sounded like Victor had chewed through his own leg. Your body is broken. Victor is dying. There are two babies in boxes. We need you, man. Tears saturated, then spilled out through her blindfold, and her breath came in gasping heaves. On her knees, she followed a wire. Followed a wire to a small square object at the far end of the stage. She discovered three more cords leading to three more microphones. Victor made a sound no dog should make. He sounded almost human in his despair. Mallory gathered everything she could. The amplifier, small enough to carry the microphones, the cords, a stand. I'm sorry, Victor. I'm so sorry. Victor, I'm sorry. At last, she stepped down from the stage. Victor saw something in here. Where was it now? There was no stopping the tears, yet a stronger feeling took over, a precious calm. Motherhood, as if she were a stranger to herself, operating for the babies alone. Crossing the bar, she came close enough to Victor to feel some part of him rub against her leg. Was it his side, his snout, was he saying goodbye? Stay away from me! Stay away from me! Her voice sounded like a stranger's as she screamed before exiting the bar. Her voice sounded like a stranger. The sun out there was hot against her skin. She moved quickly back to the car. The thoughts were electric. Events were happening too fast. She slipped off the concrete curb and smacked hard into her car. Frantic, she loaded the things in the back. When she got behind the wheel, she wailed. The cruelty, this world, victory. She had the key in the ignition and was about to turn it. Then, her black hair wet with sweat, she paused. What were the chances something had gotten into the car? What were the chances something was seated beside her in the passenger seat? If something had, she'd be delivering it to the children. To get home, you absolutely have to look at the odometer. So Mallory flared, flailed by the car. She tore off her blindfold. She saw nothing but the black windshield. She was alone in the car. And using the odometer, she drove the same two and a half miles back, then four to Shillingham, then a quarter mile more to home, hitting every curb and sign on the way. Only five miles an hour. It felt like eternity. After parking, she gathered what she'd found, and inside, the door secure behind her, she opened her eyes and rushed to the baby's bedroom. 
They were awake, red-faced, crying, and hungry. Much later, she lay awake, shaking on the kitchen floor, staring at the microphones and two small amplifiers beside her, remembering the sounds Victor made. Dogs are not mad. Dogs can go mad. Dogs are not mad. And whenever she thought she was going to stop crying, she started again. <laughs> That scream was worth the whole show. <laughs>